energy utility. Building at Aim for Run, JCSU. And Teresa Lars, DOE. We have a quorum. Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we started at 1007, for the records taken. Uh, approval of agenda. Um, we normally spend time reading the minutes. I'd like to say let's do that at the end. Um, and I had requested if we could move the GHG inventory discussion to the end because I think it's important that we do address our pay. And here's Edward Yim. Uh, great. The recommendations of the Benchmark Subcommittee. Um, I sent around. Is anybody else affected by the low? Um, if, if I'm the only one, I'm happy with staying this way. <laughs> we can lift the shades. Oh, the, we can turn on the back lights also. The lights are not on. Thanks. I thought it was mood lighting. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were going to watch the movie. I did too. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. Did everybody have any Valentine's Day? Good. 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 Looks like I see people with flowers in the left one. Something from me. Oh, chocolates in. Wow. <laughs> um, okay, so the reason for the urgency is that, um, or not urgency, because for us to discuss these issues that we've had sort of kicking around for a while, um, the PSC plan. I got it really productive set of working group sessions with a bunch of stakeholders on um, what measures ought to be used in the forthcoming implementation by the utilities of additional energy efficiency or demand response programs. Recommendations came out of that and were provided to the PSC, and the PSC is accepting comment on those recommendations. And the, recommend, uh, the report was published, I think, on February 11th. Yeah, Sorry, 30 what? days from the January 30th. Oh. January. When the recommendation January the went 30th. in. January 30th. January 30th. So they, the, any comments will come in from the SCU advisory board if there will be comments, will be. Oh. I guess March second. Actually, no. It's, it was yeah. from March there was a February eleventh. I thought it was notice. February eleventh. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the order is February eleventh. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so the report March, is January thirtieth. Yeah. March eleventh. So March twelfth. March tenth, I think, because there are twenty nine days in February. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's is it a like weekend. A thirty day comment. Oh, it's yeah, it's not March. Okay, not later than thirty March days. Eleventh. Oh, and look no. at that. There is an SEU advisory board meeting on the tenth, so we could actually. If we be wait until, or I mean, start our discussion now and finish up our discussion on the 10th, um, which is good, which is helpful. So, the benchmark subcommittee of the SEU Advisory Board had been looking into some questions uh, that had been also kicking around for a number of years, I think, by the Advisory Board members on whether or not the advisory board should recommend either legislative changes to benchmarks or contract changes that could be made to the SEU's implementation of its statutory benchmarks and or none of the above, but perhaps recommendations to be made in the context of the PSC effort because some uh, changes or new measures may or may not lend themselves to implementation by the SEU as opposed to by the utilities. So the point of the benchmark subcommittee convening was to get a handle on recommendations, if any, either for internal use by the SEU or for an external recommendation to the PSC in the context of setting metrics for the utility implementation of programs. Um, so with that as a backdrop, I thought, um, it might be helpful, Adrian or Gary, do you, do you think it might be helpful to talk about where you, or, or Dr. Cooper, where you guys got in the PSC 
Mr. Seating with some sort of big picture on recommendations? I'm not sure, Carrie, that you want to provide this kind of a brush over it or? Well, actually, as, as I pointed out, oh, you're wrong. Times, exactly. I've not been participating um, in, in the, right. in the subcommittee so. process specifically because um, potential for. Exactly, in terms of decision. Um, so I'll start, but then uh, Megan Partridge is on the call who has been participating actively in the process. So I wanted to say, first of all, and just reiterate what you said, I think uh, from my perspective, the working group process was extremely productive, um, executed within a decently um, decent time period in terms of restricted, in terms of by the legislation, but a lot of inputs and injections. And what I wanted to indicate is I believe from my perspective that the process that emanated from the DOEE, working with PEPCO, the DCSEU Advisory Board, Washington Gas, was also very fruitful and helpful because we didn't start from, I would like to say, uh, ground zero. Um, so in that process, we focused on and tried to really focus on the areas in which the legislation gave us guidance in which we needed to uh, do so, and focusing on like the performance metrics, the targets, um, and evaluating the cost-benefit analysis, cost recovery type mechanisms. I know that there was some evaluation and Lance and others uh, talked a little bit about the report that we thought would have been very helpful. I know that um, the Office of the People's Council had some concerns about advancing the report, and I'm not going to use the right terminology, but that would provide us guidance as it relates to the market needs in the District of Columbia, and wanted to await uh, information from the roadmap and the electrification study that's underway by DOEE, but there was an understanding that there is a differentiation between that particular report and a report that would actually analyze the market needs within the District of Columbia, which would ensure that you're being more cost effective, identify the gaps, and really be able to design programs and move programs forward that are speaking to the interests of the district and also in alignment with the clean energy legislation as well as the goals there. Um, we did discuss as well um, low to moderate income programs because the legislation speaks to the fact that uh, the <coughs> utility should focus primarily on those particular programs. However, primarily was the term that was focused on whether or not there are opportunities still yet within the commercial arena that still yet does not supplant but help to assist the DCSEU reach its particular goals and targets as well as the broader goals of the District of Columbia government. So looking at opportunities that may exist there. Um, the legislation did speak to the fact that our programs should also not in any way impede what the nonprofit entities are moving forward as well as small businesses and based on our experiences with this in Maryland as well as other injections that were provided by ACE Triple E as well as AOBA we believe that we're in a very good place where we would not be ultimately kind of overriding those particular programs in any way um, so I think it was very fruitful. The study or the report that's before us, we talked about cost effectiveness standards. We talked about whether or not uh, how we would treat low to moderate income programs in terms of evaluating those programs from a performance perspective. There were a few variations of opinions around that particular area. And the report in the back, and I don't have, I'm trying to go to it, kind of summarizes uh, the areas that are still yet unresolved. All. And those areas were processes for adopting a uniform technical reference manual. Um, also, some of the areas in terms of cost recovery, in terms of expensing or amortizing EEZR program costs, as well as there was some uh, concerns as it relates to uh, really focusing on the performance incentive mechanisms uh, within that particular context, being that other um, actions are taking place with the Public Service Commission as well. Um, so high, very high level, those were the areas that we did discuss. The report does indicate areas where there was agreement or consensus, as well as opportunities for each participant um, to offer their comments as to areas in which they were not aligned with what was designated as being the viewpoints of the group as well. 
So I'll pause and turn it over to Megan to provide more detail in each of those respective areas. Megan, can I just interrupt one minute before you start real quick? Sure. Yeah, this is like, she knows my voice. We're in like 15 groups together. <laughs> um, so just I want to make a note on Donna's comment regarding OPC's opinion on the report that was to be done. We did not say that we did not support doing the report. We said it was too early in the process at this point. Um, we felt that as DOE was doing two studies right now, let's wait and see what those studies give us. And then from there, if additional uh, studies are warranted and after the Program. Our point was that let's go ahead and see what programs the utilities is going to give us first, then we can design what study needs to be done. We already know where the gap exists in the market. Um, it's very clear. We have DCSEU up and running. We know where the gap exists. It is in your low to moderate income area. Um, we also ask that the utilities have a portfolio that encompasses all income levels. Uh, all rate payers will have to pay for this. So that was more of OPC's opinion and group, and we will be filing comments, so they'll be more fleshed out individually. OPC will be filing comments. So, um, and OPC, as um, Dr. Cooper did state, we did have several subcommittee meetings on the metrics. Um, PSC asked us to hold meetings separately outside, so we did do that, and we met with several stakeholders, and those are reflected in the comments as well. So. Go ahead, Megan. And Adrian, just a clarification of the board members. Um, the report that she's referring to is a potential study, Correct. energy efficiency and demand response potential study, potential. Um, where the opinion is that we should wait to get that done at a later date more so than getting it off the ground right now. So it's, it's not a, a report as in one of these other reports that you're right. seeing. It's oh. just a potential study. Potential study. To yes, understand, right. you know, Correct. energy yeah. efficiency. And just Could one, you one comment around that. So thank you for that. Could I just ask for clar yes. further clarification? Sorry, yeah. this is Nina Dodge. Um, I, I was mixed up as to what reports figured. Right. Out. So it, is the report you're talking about, does it have a name? Is it referenced in the It is, it is on page uh, 7, um, and it started on page 6. So in that particular section, um, it references item number 20 the need for an EEDR potential study, and that's to focus on technical, economic, and achievable EEDR potential in the District of Columbia. And so as Adrian indicated, uh, they wanted to really look at the electrification roadmap as well as the carbon neutrality strategy and look at the results of that. So there was, just from the working group perspective as well as those that were around the table, that there was a distinction between that as well as the potential study in terms of what that particular roadmap and neutrality strategy would provide. It was more policy oriented. And so there was also some references as well uh, from ACEEE as it relates to kind of just the national uh, direction around this as it relates to since 2000, it's become more common for utilities to conduct studies to make the policy case for energy efficiency. So it's something that I think needs to obviously be looked at, but I understand what Adrian is indicating, but there was a separation and a distinction uh, between what would come from the studies are the reports that come out of DOEE versus what this potential study would report would ultimately provide or study. Right, yeah. I think, I think, uh, Meg, I mean, really quickly, um, the other, the, the one distinction I would make, um, or just kind of a She's clarification um, from what Adrian said, so I think the difference between, um, the, or rather, the value of the potential study, um, you know, we, we may be, I agree that, you know, we, we can say where the programmatic gaps are um, or aren't, but the potential study takes it a, a little bit, a level deeper, and it's really looking at, like, the actual market, market penetration and the market structure and down to, like, the specific end use types. So it's, um, so even though we have a general understanding of what the existing capabilities are and what broad market sectors don't, aren't, aren't being reached, that's, that's true, but when you want to get to the next level deeper so that we can really have more nuanced um, program design, and which is especially important if we are, at, you know, the more we want to have coordinated programs and, you know, working together to reach the city's goals, having more granular data allows for more granular targeting. 
um, and means that we can work more efficiently without overlapping with, you know, what the SEU is, is, is doing and, you know, in supporting them and augmenting in those areas maybe that aren't being as successfully reached. So uh, is that, that's the only distinction I, I would want to make there. Um, Sorry, Megan, Nina, again, um, when, you, when you talk about data, that's data you already have, but put in different forms? No, ma'am. Oh, it's different data? No. Yeah. Sorry, maybe you could clarify a little bit the distinction between that data and what you already have. Or, or sure. maybe this um, is too much detail for this meeting. I don't know. This no, I can, I can give it a high level version. So... The way that potential studies work, there's you know two ways of going about doing them, but they, uh, well, there's many ways, but the two big ways. One is um, is conducting you know statistically um, significant surveys, um, building walkthroughs, um, and you're really getting an understanding of what equipment and what level of efficiency exists in a service territory, and then. There's a layer of economic analysis that goes lays over that, so you understand what is technically achievable in terms of um, energy efficiency upgrades. And then, you know, on top of the technical, then there's the um, then you're looking at what's economically achievable. And then they're kind of and then there's another layer of like well, what's realistically achievable. Um, and so, and then the other approach could use be a data driven approach. Um, using some of like the AMI type data and combining that with a couple other data sources, and you can kind of back into it by looking at load shapes, um, and that's a little bit more complicated, but to, to go into quickly. Um, but in either case, there's a lot of analysis and um, that would go into it, that so that the outputs aren't going to be data that we have currently. Okay, thank you very much. You mentioned that there were two reports DOEE was already working on. Um, what are the timings? For like, what are they and what are the timings? So Edward Yim is here, and Edward, two or four. It was my understanding that Edward did some information. Did you just turn your head? In 2020, sometime in 2020, you guys were going to have some preliminary information on uh, the roadmaps. Right, so, so Edward's in charge of those. Um, but, Toward the end of the year. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. And also, uh, OPC's other concern was that we had building standards going into place. So, give it an opportunity to get off the ground. Let's see where we are. Do a complete study. I mean, there was several things going into our factor of not just saying no to the study up front. But I feel like there's a lot of different things going on in the city right now. Mm -hmm. And let's get the programs off the ground, then do the study after we have their information. I know it's all different, but it all makes a difference in terms of how we do our EE programs in the city. So, I mean, it'll all be in our comments, but we can talk offline. I don't want to hold everybody hostage. Oh, thank you. I mean, so, I and I think we can talk all about all of these further, I think everyone here is going to want to take a look and potentially submit comments in their individual capacity. Um, a question that has been kicking around that the board has been entertaining, and that's the subject of today, potentially this is the subject of Tuesday the 11th or whatever day that is. Um, which, by the way, I'm in a position, so I'm not going to be able to make that day, so we'll figure something out on that, but is whether or not the SEU Advisory Board wants to make any recommendations or comments from what arose out of the work of the Benchmark Subcommittee. And what, from my a sort of 30,000 foot up in the air perspective, I know that there's probably going to be a little apples and oranges, like some of the things I think that the Benchmark Subcommittee were talking about, may or may not be applicable at all in the PSC scenario, but I also think that the Benchmark Subcommittee and the Advisory Board have been talking about all these things for a long time. So if they aren't finding a home in the SEU, um, will they find a home in the PSC setting? And if not now, maybe in the future or ever. I mean, I think all those things are up for grabs. I think we've been talking about these four um, kinds of issues which were the intent was, I think, to align um, the SEU's objective, uh, 
targets or sort of overt express targets with things that the district is talking is talking about now and may have started talking about since the SE was created and the original benchmarks were first formulated. Um, so again, they may or may not have bearing or relevance in what the SEU is doing um, or how it's communicated. For example, um, one that we've been talking about a lot was whether or not there ought to be a strategic priority of a greenhouse gas reduction target. The district's contemporary legislation is all phrased in terms of, or um, DOE plans are phrased in terms of greenhouse gas reductions, but the SEU metrics aren't measured in terms of expressly in terms of greenhouse gas reductions, though greenhouse gas reductions are tracked. So that was a question. Um, a second question has been around for a long time whether or not the energy savings benchmark um, should be combined, one single gas and electric, I believe was the way that we've been phrasing it. But that was the second thing that we've been talking about for a very long time and questioning whether or not that would have bearing in the PSC context. The third was converting your one savings accounting to lifetime savings accounting. Um, and the fourth has been whether or not we should be converting back into a statutory mandate um, what is now a tracking measure, which is reducing peak demand and ways of achieving that. So I would actually like to flip the order and start with, because Millie is going to be leaving in a half an hour, the fourth one that we've been talking about with reducing peak demand. Um, I'm sorry, was there a fifth uh, No, there are four, and just so people know, it's on page uh, five of the minutes. Yeah. Uh, these are all listed on page five of the oh, minutes. Oh, thank you. Just and is this, Teresa, is this hand up the one that was on the report of the Benchmark Subcommittee? No, it's, I'm sending it around now, the one that we looked at the last thing with the four items that you referenced. Okay. Yes, so I'm passing that around. Oh, good. Just as a refresher. Sort of like <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um. uh, hey, 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 Becky, just a quick question. Um, so I... Before we kind of combine the two issues, the, the response to the energy efficiency report and the sort of benchmark output where, where we're considering these changes, yes. um, it seems like in the energy efficiency report, there is a placeholder on page 16. I think it's section two. It just says relationship to DC SEU program. It, it sounds like there's a, a plan to get an opinion from SEU related to the proposed program. Um, can so, so before we dive into the specific benchmark changes, do we think that some sort of opinion from the advisory board is required during this public comment period, or is there would it be more appropriate for us to kind of field that opinion through the SEU, you know, uh, opinion to the to the um, working group on the proposed program? I, I guess my quick answer, but certainly others, please pipe in, is by statute, I think that there was consultation of the SEU advisory board. Um, I was yes. either present or on the phone for all of Adrian and other members of the advisory board were also certainly present and consulted and participated and provided contributions to that process. I don't think there's any mandate that the SEU advisory board do anything. I think the point was to consult us if we wished to provide something and we have already done so uh, through that PSC process and we want to do more. That's what I think we would discuss as a board. Um, I think that the SEU will be probably making decisions independently of what the board does in terms of contributions um, to the comment period. And I agree, and there was one reference point that came out of the report as well that the working group collectively had recommended what she would be doing as, in general is that we be required to present our proposals to DLEE, the DCSEU, and the advisory board in advance of us even making the filing as well. So even though that's subsequent to, um, there will be that opportunity for engagement as well, and we're committed to that. Um, okay, so I, I think the question is whether or not the advisory board wants to consider any of these recommendations with regard to its input.
input into the PSC process. I'm, oh, oh, there's a request for people on the phone to mute their systems because there's some funky feedback. So we don't want to discourage you from participating. <laughs> it's also a dance from the 70s. Uh, <laughs> it's not <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't yet dancing in the 70s, no. <laughs> oh, no. We don't believe that for one moment. Some DOE leaders the dancing in the 70s, but that's a different story. Uh, there was a <laughs> um, so, okay, I, I did want to start with a discussion of the peak demand reduction goal. So I know that this is something that um, I have talked about for some period of time in several contexts, which is maybe more a question um, that, again, it isn't necessarily SCU. It could be DC generally. It may or may not be PSC and utility programs. But whether or not there ought to be something that is incentivizing storage, battery storage, in the district as a means of, for example, reducing peak demand reduction, um, which is a target that is in other states, several other states, including red states. <laughs> when you so, say battery, it means be battery. Let's just be agnostic mean, about I'm sorry, storage. any kind of storage technology. Um, <laughs> yes, and, and or, yes, it could be thermal. a number. I'm sorry? Thermal. Thermal, exactly. So any kinds of storage technology. But... Largely, the issue is that we used to have in the SEU benchmarks as a statutory means a mandate for reducing peak demand, and then it got converted into a tracking goal. And then the question is whether or not it would be beneficial. In the SEU context, it was a question whether it would be beneficial to turn it back into a hard target. And if not, then there's a question as to whether or not that ought to be a metric to be considered for the utilities. And I would see that coming out as something like a utility procurement requirement or the like, and that would have the effect of stimulating a market like we have for solar in D.C. with the SREX. Go ahead. Thank you, Vicki. Um, I would like to know from DOEE, I guess it's Edwards' department, um, I, I believe that the Clean Energy D.C. roadmap um, maybe even quantified the role that, that – uh, peak demand shifting uh, might play in reducing emissions. In other words, um, if it's already been figured out what the role of peak uh, demand shifting is um, under the current kind of configuration of energy uh, sources, I mean, obviously it could change if we're blanketed with solar, but peak demand time could, but the concept, if, you've, if this has been quantified already, even if preliminarily, I think it would be really good to know the, what the role of peak demand needs to be to achieve our 32 and, 1950, and 1950 mandates. So I, I, I think it would be great to get some, you know, kind of science behind this. Sorry, Edward. Oh, that's okay. Um, I'm generally, yeah, but as you mentioned, Nina, the, the Clean Energy DC plan talks about peak demand reduction. That's something that we need to achieve. But generally, we have talked about it in terms of just cost effective um, measure of ensuring clean energy supply rather than it directly contributing to clean energy supply. Um, so that's, I think, one, the, the first point to be noted. On that. The, um, we do know, we haven't quantified you know, how much greenhouse gas reduction contribution we need to get from peak demand reduction activities. Okay. That's, uh, we, we've only really quantified it from a supply, supply standpoint. Right. Um, but then having said that, peak demand actually has a direct relationship to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and we are trying to figure that out in our electrification roadmap. So I think Patty might touch on that later, um, which is the issue of we, we need to know what the marginal emissions rate of the grid is. And so that's what we are, that's one of the ex exercises that we are doing in the study. Excellent. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
so that we can know what the hourly marginal emissions rate is, and then we will know when it will be most beneficial in terms of greenhouse gas reduction, uh, exactly which hours we need to be uh, shifting the peak load to, or even reducing or avoiding those peaks. Thank you very much. And so I mean, we can, we can, we, we do think about this as a potentially the kind of just hard data that we can have to establish a program like you know the avoidance or default of a peak genera generation that some states have developed. Right. Thank you. So I think I mean that's helpful. Thank you. In terms of also recognizing that this issue is. Um, takes the two forms as does everything, I <laughs> think, um, between an energy savings question on the one hand and a GHG reduction on the other, and there's obviously a relationship there, or you know, there is or isn't a relationship there, and I think that to the extent, and I'm maybe getting out ahead of the board, um, that there is a consensus that the SEU has translated a message of energy savings to customers, which is a different question than incentivizing or changing the market on greenhouse gas reductions by themselves, that the peak demand shifting or isn't necessarily a target that should come into the SEU um, as a statutory mandate. So I think I'm going to suggest that there was a consensus by the benchmark subcommittee that it not be addressed in the SEU context. So the question was whether or not the board believes that there should be a recommendation and maybe an explanation as to why it isn't necessarily a fit in the SEU context, but would encourage or not it's being taken up in the in the PSC context. As relates. To this document, to, to or just providing comments for the PSC's current <laughs> or future thinking in setting the metrics for the utilities to be implementing energy efficiency and demand reduction programs, demand response programs. Excuse me. I like that formulation. Wait, wait. So just so I'm clear, Vicki, you're saying the our comment to the PSC working group would be whether. SEU has a role in peak demand reduction, or whether SEU sort of affirmatively does not have a role? Is that sort of the consensus that we're trying to reach? Well, or just, I'm trying to understand what the consensus is, but I guess it was my sense that it's not that we would be recommending to the PSC to direct the SEU role. It would be more to just Canada. our own recognition that if the, the, the efforts to modify or to change peak demand behavior don't necessarily fit within the SCU business model, do we think that there is a, do we agree that that's the case and or do we believe that it would be a productive forward-looking recommendation that the PSC consider it in the utility context? I, I think it, if, if, This issue is going to be looked at in many different ways this year. I mean, we heard from Edward that, that there's an attempt to get at some quantification. Um, and I can speak to the, there's a new committee under METS's power path on rate design and the whole question of, of um, variant, variable time, oh God, I'm forgetting these acronyms. Yeah, time pricing. The, um, time of use, et cetera, real-time pricing, which is all about uh, <clears throat> manipulating peak demand, uh, shifting peak demand and flattening it. Um, that will come up in a, in a few months. Um, I, I think that I, I wouldn't like, I don't like to say never say, I mean, never say never. We, it might be that such a benchmark might make a lot of sense, um, you know, in another year. In which country? Uh, in terms of SEU. Okay. Um, so, I mean, if we can, for this year, I don't know, maybe we should ask for 
I know you're tying it to the report. I'm, I'm a bit confused as to, to what extent we're talking about our current contract, SEU contract, a future contract of the SEU, and responding to this uh, efficiency report. So I'm a little lost there. No, but very fair. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, sometimes co cobbling is good. Sometimes it. So yeah. yeah you know, no, I think so. That, thank you. That's a fair point. And what, I guess maybe there's also an issue in terms of if the SEU advisory board is to make a comment, it doesn't have to make a comment with regard to the SEU and right. what should happen with right. the SEU. I think it, what, what I was just getting at was that this discussion has germinated in the context of SEU benchmarks. Um, there was you know, probably a very strong reaction against advocating for a change to a statutory benchmark at this point given where we are in a five-year contract with the SEU. Um, I was raising it in the context of there being this live animal that's evolving right now, which is the PSC's definition of the metrics. And so is this a moving train and we ought to be on it for that purpose, just to, without getting granular necessarily, saying it should be something that, the SEC, that we recommend the PSC consider. So kind of get a historical perspective. This First, is Tommy talking, Tommy Wells talking. <laughs> <laughs> yes, now they want to take me seriously. Um, first off, this is really a good piece of work. This is really good. Um, very, that's very impressive piece of work. Second is, a number of jurisdictions have been have a, a, you know, directly addressed peak power and peak shape. What has prevented D.C., and I apologize for the broadness of the question, what's prevented D.C. from addressing peak power as other states have? I think if we wanted to put a big ticket item out there, I would say time of use uh, rates is a very key driver for peak demand uh, and load shifting. We don't have that here in D.C. Well, I get that. What has prevented us from doing that? Um, years ago. <laughs> they had a pilot, <laughs> and so I know this is, again, and Carrie's smiling because, again, I'm sure he can't weigh in on this, but these are things that are ultimately under consideration and will be being reviewed by the Public Service Commission. Well, we have frankly. a working group starting exactly. up under the yeah. under the that's Mets that's Department. Why, why didn't it, why did it well, stop? It seems like it we're didn't? late to this yeah, we compared are. to other jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if there was an equity debate or something that prevented us from addressing it. Usually DC is way ahead of everybody. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, did something happen in this conversation yeah. that I'm not aware yeah, of? Yeah, two mergers and METSIS. I really think it's overload. Um, the mergers and METSIS process, and, and maybe the it was thought that METSIS would take this on. And we did. And we did. And, we, and, and in we fact, we got, it. and we were getting what we asked for, which right. was a working group. Even so that's the delay. Merger. Even prior merger, that no prior merger. We had a we had a, a, a multi-year uh, proceeding on time of year, on uh, variable variable rates uh, without defining you know look, mm -hmm. look writ large, and we had some very very intense hearings in a an inf what's called an informal investigative proceeding that the that the launched by the PSC, and many of us around the table did a lot of work on that um, and frankly it, it got subsumed by by the, the the PSC didn't have was not required by law to pronounce on that they took it up progressively at the time I must say they were ahead and, and we got very good people to the table but there was no incentive for the PSC to put it uh, up on their agenda, and there certainly is no incentive, uh, you know, for any other party uh, to do so other than civic groups. But um, my understanding is for commercial customers, there is a relation to their peak. If they if they shave their peak, they save some money on their bills. Yes. If I'm not mistaken, yes, they there is some of that. Yeah. Commercial yeah. Uh, time of use uh, exists, but it is poorly written, so that uh, the the actual um, Motivate. In fact, uh, we looked at this in our MEDSIS working group. The commercial time of use um, uh, pricing uh, intervals are such that really uh, 
they're meaningless to incentivize uh, the commercial buildings to so because engage. you guys are leaders in energy around the city, that's why you're on this advisory board. I think it'd be wholly appropriate to say that this needs to be a priority for the city coming from this board, but um, not, you know, not necessarily through the SEU or unless the SEU were engaged in a broader effort that included, you know, the SEU could not drive this, but the board could speak to it and, um, and just pull it out directly. But I just wanted to know if there were some triggers in there that I didn't know about um, for the board, but it sounds like there are not. Not that we know. I know it's a priority for DOEE and what Edward's looking at and the work that Edward has done on wireless alternatives. Um, peak use goes straight into um, that issue. And so it's a priority for DOEE to figure this out, but, um, and I think the SEU board, advisory board speaking to it is wholly appropriate without saying, you know, SEU could drive this alone because it can. Well, agreed. And I think that was, you know, part of the genesis of this was that it may not be an SEU issue per se or by itself, but here's this other vehicle. This is the time. I, I this, strongly support what you just said, and Tommy. Yeah. Just um, one, I think it makes a heck of a lot of sense. And I'm supportive as well. And just in the comments again, going back to reconciling the various streams that are taking place at the commission. So being able to cite as well as an awareness as it relates to the board, as it relates to where the commission is going with this, and then the overarching position that we think that this needs to be advanced within that context. So not indicating that there's nothing that's being done. It has been some time, but reconciling again with Power Path and some other actions that are taking place, our support for that moving forward in some context. So giving them some degree of credit as it relates to how they're addressing this currently, from my perspective. And again, there's a working group that, that they're kicking off. Right. So I think maybe that building on that, it might be just simpler to address the working group, to, to, you know, to praise them for launching this working group, that that's going to be one of the central areas where this... Or to just make a, a sort of very overt statement that yeah. it's something that ought to be considered, be but there's a bunch of places now, where it is being discussed and it work its way into either yeah. SCE or SCE at some point. Right, and, th and that way we don't have to pronounce yeah. on, on immediacy for SCE involvement or not or whatever. Uh, so I, th I remember that PSC proceeding because I think... 11, 14, 11 14. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can, can I can I just quickly play devil's advocate? So I mean I, I think that there are other players. So I think rates are an important um, aspect to um, so, I, so I think we're talking about peak shaving, but I think it's coincident peak shaving with PJM's peak. Um, so I think rates are an important part of it. I think Pepco definitely has some avenue, but is there a reason why SA, SAU can't also be a part of, of peak shaving, coincident peak shaving? maybe through an incentive program. Um, I mean, I see ways that potentially resiliency plus peak shaving could be bundled and contribute to multiple objectives of the SEU. Um, I see ways that SEU could incentivize peak shaving or, or demand response enrollment with PJM directly for commercial customers that, that would kind of improve the district's participation and constant peak shaving. Um, so I, I see that there could be a, a role for SEU that wouldn't require any type of direct direct load control or anything like that. I, um, Tommy speaking, I expect, is that something that we should explore? I expect yeah. SEU will be a part of this with a broader strategy. SEU is probably um, just not enough to be the driver, but the board is important. That's why the board speaks to it. But I expect that SEU would be a part of it if. Um, there's an agreement and direction of um, how to do it, um, whether it be you know on which side of the meter, which kinds of investments, role of batteries, all that stuff would be comprehensive. But because SEU does not have much direct control, um, I don't see this being a measurable um, outcome for SEU. But I definitely think that the board, um, you guys would be very sensitive and open to the of um, advising the SEU to participate in a broader strategy for the city on Peachtree. So, with um, 
Back, back to Nina's good question about organizationally, where are the opportunities to do to make recommendations with regard to the SEU <clears throat> itself? It does sound like there's a complement with SEU's um, programs in PJM, SEU's innovation, places it reports to us in its strategy that wouldn't necessarily require, and we don't have to decide this all now, but, but wouldn't you, necessarily I require think we, Because it's not. It would, I don't believe, and this is a proposal, I don't believe it's easily measurable. And so you don't want to divert SEU resources away from the areas where they have to be measured and make goals. So I'm saying in the um, one of the recommendations that the board had made that has been taken up is that the SEU delivers this strategy to the SEU, although, I mean to the board, although I'm not sure where we are. Which it. strategy? It's, it's the SEU's planning document. For... It, what it's going to be doing in the... The annual plan is it's submitted at the end of each fiscal year. Uh, the annual plan for next year will come around August of this year. It is due 60 days before the end of the year. So that's the document I think you're referring to that really lays out the SEU plans for the next 12 months um, from a programming standpoint. So from my understanding, true peak shape is going to require investments on both sides of the meter. Right. And it's yeah. going to have to be comprehensive. I think that the SEU, I think the board, you guys represent folks that drive this question. The SEU is a, a small cog in this wheel. So I would not do anything but use your authority as the board and wait as the board to say, come on, we need to get going with this. But I don't know, I wouldn't divert much energy so to speak, of um, <laughs> SEU into this yet I agree. until yeah. there's a broader strategy for the SEU. Gosh, it's funny how the metaphors follow <laughs> this, uh, they plug into. Um, so until there's that, um, my recommendation is that you use the authority of the board to highlight the recommendation to the city council and the mayor, if you like, whoever reads the I mean, report. The other thing we could do on the other... Uh, sorry, did you have your hand up, Adrian? Yeah, go ahead, though. I'm, I'm good. It's not going to go away. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, it might be that, I mean, we could always ask, the board could always ask the SEU to lay out in their plan, no, not, not in their, yeah, to, to investigate areas where they might pile it, incorporate this kind of highlight. Um, you know, the thing is, Nina, is you could do this off the top of your head. Yeah, I we all know about, <laughs> you know, demand, you know, controls. And use um, of storage. Yeah, all that stuff. You, you can do it off the top of your head. The, what we need is the, the bigger players yeah. to lay out saying either demand a strategy or get a strategy from Pepco Echelon. And then, because, you know, they're a player now in the efficiency world as well. And we're concerned about redundancies. Mm -hmm. And so I think that um, the, the big guys need to help lay out a strategy, and then we figure out and, and then direct SEU. Big guys, including you. It, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, uh, I mean the, the, what Edward described is quantifying. Yeah, we're going to end up there anyway. Well, and, and where the SEU fits into all of that will help as well. So. But I do have just a question about. Whether there are things that the SCU, leaving aside from the moment, whether or not it's a measurable benchmark, because there are other benchmarks, like generating income through PJM. You know, it's, it's not a benchmark, but it's a, what is that? Well, it, it's, it is part of that it's leveraging a, goal that yeah. we set up. Leveraging, so, yeah, thank it's you. Part yeah. Of the yeah. Right, so I, I don't mean like by itself, but it, it could be a means of, potentially a means of achieving one of these additional objectives, like leveraging resources. Well, every time they change out a light bulb, it's part of, of that. Sure. Yeah. My, my question was just more that um, the SEU was created in order to change the market. So is it, how much does it need to have to wait, or and or can it be leading in some, you know, by way of example, so that the... 
I, I think yeah, the, the big key here, um, as the director mentioned, is being able to have access to real-time data from the utility standpoint. And even if the SE were to go out there and incentivize certain measures, still being able to measure those impacts would require the utility to provide that close uh, real-time data to the SEU. So I think uh, what we're all seeing here are true in the sense that we need the utility to be at the table to be leading that effort. And the SEU can certainly partner with the utility, but the SEU by themselves Cannot. going out to do peak yeah. demand mm -hmm will not produce tangible results in ways we can measure it because the utility house yeah, I mean, all of the data. I mean, seriously, we, if we said to the SEU, you need to start investing in this and develop a plan, and they go out and buy a bunch of um, Tesla-scale batteries to put in homes to reduce um, peak power in a house, they, they won't have much of a measurable goal on the other measures, and they won't necessarily, unless Unless, um, PJ, unless um, Pepco said this is the area that we want to do this in, it'll make a, a difference um, because this area, you know, adds to you know the cost of power because of usage during this period of time. Mm -hmm. Unless that is all on the table, they just blew a bunch of money, um, mm -hmm. yeah. and I I just think that um, it's the tail wagging the dog if we're not careful. But of course we want them to participate. But these guys kind of do their jobs. And so do we. I got it. So I think that the CU advisory board should strongly state that, um, that this needs to be done. That um, the city has to develop a peak, um, a strategy to reduce peak demand. And maybe. And I would strongly emphasize in that strategy that we go beyond just the traditional energy efficiency measures. If we want to talk about battery storage and other clean technologies that help you know, the peak, then we should emphasize that in the report. Because if we don't, the utilities already are doing some peak demand programming. Um, the question is how far do we want them to go and what else do we want them to be adding into that toolbox mm -hmm. as part of their peak demand strategy. Right. And that's so critical when you say that, like how far do you want us to go and that even lends itself to even energy efficiency. So we have some very laudable goals as it relates to the district and energy efficiency as well as reducing carbon and greenhouse gas emissions. But there is obviously program design, there are new alternatives around non-wire alternatives, costs to achieve, analysis as it relates to the best placement, et cetera. So all of those variables, and like you just said, uh, Director Wells, really a strategy um, that's guided by research and data in order to actually support it. Yeah, and we can have I, that, I mean, I, if we can mention the study that Edward mentioned, I mean, that Tommy Well, you know, hats off. I mean, I think you've really conceptualized our input, and I think we need to mention all aspects. I would also mention solar for all. Um, I mean, <laughs> solar for all is already piloting some use of storage, um, and uh, I'm not saying add this into it, but solar for all, uh, you know, with a tweak in legislation could end up uh, being one of the big drivers for peak uh, dis peak load design in the city. I'm just saying. So so I know that these are the four topics we're trying to discuss, but I think what more so since we have these comments that are coming up due, if we could decide which of the four, maybe all four need to be put into comments on behalf of the advisory board, why are they important to the utility and how do they are applicable to the EEDR programs that are coming online, I think that would probably be a better strategy if we're going to do a three, two, three page comment. And how is that applicable? How does that help? Why does it need to be addressed by PSC when looking at the formulation of the programs that utilities are going to put forward? I think that should probably be where we are um, because I understand how peak demand plays into that. We can write maybe a you know tin liner yeah. why that's important. And if that could be our focus, I think we get a lot further down the line of why we think these are notable, why do they not or do they apply to DCSU and how the board is looking at that and the transformation of maybe the next five-year project you know, our contract rather, I think that would probably direct our conversation a little bit better. Um, so that's just my no. spill. Yeah, no, 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 very fair. <laughs> um, so with Adrian's good suggestion, let's focus these 
four things that the benchmark subcommittee talked about in the context of the PSC, whether or not these are things that we think we ought to be mentioning in our three-pager, and I agree because I certainly don't have the bandwidth to write anything <laughs> more, <laughs> and I don't, I'm not hearing any volunteers necessarily <laughs> on any of these issues, so if we're going to be writing something up to put into the PSC comments, but let's definitely, I would still like to understand a little better um, for my own yeah. edification whether or not some of the ideas, and I don't know if Millie is still on the phone that she was talking about in terms of bundling the PJM are, are um, separate or are you know, standalone kinds of things that could happen or are part of a big strategy. Only only makes sense in the context of the big strategy that we're just talking about. And that's just my own ignorance, not my. Yeah. Um, so, but that's that's more SEU specific and to come around, I think, for time. I think, I think there are two meetings plan. here. One is what Adrian was just describing, yeah. addressing in February. The so March. that's what this one is. Right, and then and a we'll further have to wrap one. Up by March. We'll have yeah, one. and then okay. after that we can delve exactly. into it. Yeah. Exactly, okay. right. Great, thank you. Um, so we've so pretty can much we covered that in the minutes. We're talking about two separate yeah, trains. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so is there a consensus on the part of the um, board that comments to the PSC ought to, in a high level way, highlight the need for a citywide strategy, both sides of the meter, et cetera, with regard to maximizing the ability to um, shift peak demand, manage peak demand in a way that will maximize greenhouse gas reduction opportunities. Now I'll say that that's the answer. Okay, do we, should we vote on that or should okay. we just start writing? Let's vote. We're sorry, go ahead. Can I, re can I revise that? Please. Yeah, can we revise that to coincident peak demand? Thank I think you. that's an important yeah, yeah, word to add yeah, there. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Why? A lot of explanation has yeah. to be done if you put in a uh, that. I think you can mention coincident demand in there in the par in the eleven lines or in a footnote, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't use that uh, without yeah. raises more questions than it asks. There's it a lot answers. more analysis that goes into coincident peak demand. Okay. Edward, maybe you can speak to that. No, I mean, yeah, generally, I mean, for that kind of yeah. purpose of advocating the city, that, that the district embrace a citywide uh, target, that it would be better to use a more general term. Right. Uh, there are different kinds of peak demands. Mm -hmm. uh, coincident is one of them, and you wouldn't just want to restrict it to that. Yeah. That makes sense. Well, or something that certainly would be flushed out since we're talking very high level in terms of there are you going to get your big differences, right? Um, or what is manageable? Is that okay, Millie? Yeah, um, I, I'm, I'm. I would be curious to hear more about the, the different types of peak demand that, that would be considered, and and why they would rival coincident peak demand in terms of the environmental benefits. But I'm I'm happy to defer and, and use more general language for for this purpose. Uh, I wasn't. I wasn't suggesting that they would be a rival. It's just that you know, one it's might different. Be, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that, that may be the wrong word, but yeah. well, we just sort of the comparison. Yeah. Maybe in our second um, go on these subjects later in more detail, we could for SE purposes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Go okay. Yeah. But for for even that programs should consider peak demand when formulating programs in order to shave and get GHG reduction. First, if there's a strategy, but that they can immediately do that. Right. So longer term, higher level plus. All right, I'll put that on my in, plane. Interim. Borrowing heavily from all the experts on the phone and in the room. Okay, a second issue was, um, yeah, what did you just say? Oh, um, having a greenhouse gas reduction target, an express target, which we discussed in the context of whether or not long time ago, but maybe this would be a good time. Could we back up on where we are with um, SU contract, SU modification year, et cetera, like where, just to understand the context as we're sorting through our heads, whether we're making recommendations in the context of the SU or the BSC or both. And are you referring to the, the time frame at which we are within yeah. the contract? Well, this is year four of five, um, as you know, we're four and a half months into year four or five. Uh, the fifth year will start next September, and when I say next September, 
sorry, next October 21, we'll start the option period, which is a five-year option period um, if the district decides to exercise that option period. 20 or 21? 20. 21. October of 21. Oh, right, it's, it's, yes, it's the end of when, the five-year contract. Yeah, the contract ends September 30th to 21. October 1st will be the five-year period. So does that mean that nothing happens until then? And if, if they, uh, in other words, we wait till 2021, October, to see whether they want to exercise the EIC wants to exercise that option. No, that's the district's discretion as to whether oh, the so option the is exercised or not. I, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. We're, I, they sorry, I, I made a little flight uh, into a different zone there. Sorry, apologies. That's um, okay. So the district will wait until, DOEE, will, the district will wait till October 21 and make no, that no. Um, the process, we at least give them six months notice as to whether or not we intend to exercise an option year um, because if we don't, there is this whole transition period or procurement period that we'll have to go through in order to get that done. So we'll need plenty of lead time to be able to get... So about a year from now. Yeah. Okay. And to clarify, when you if uh, uh, an option year was extended, is it done in five-year chunks? Yes. yes. Okay. Between now and the end of the contract period, there are changes that we, we can make, but it all depends on what those changes are and, and how they can be incorporated into the existing contract. And if the um, option is exercised to extend, mm -hmm. then that would be under the same terms? No, not necessarily. We can modify certain benchmarks or make certain changes. Um, and then there's not subsequently changing the contract, as you know, yeah. it's important for your revision, that we can re, we can have them report a different way mm -hmm. on the um, on the performance metrics without changing what they're to do, but they can um, report differently mm -hmm. or a different metric. I don't want to get too far ahead, but um, that that's what would change with the um, input of the advisory board. So for instance, if GHG emissions were to be put in there, could that go in as a modification without changing the, I mean, how would that play out? I've been told yes. Yeah, it, it yes. can go in, but it depends on the, whether we're setting it as a benchmark or a tracking goal. All of the benchmarks in the contract are tied to performance incentives. Mm -hmm. um, and the way the contract is structured right now, the gas, the electric benchmark, and the renewable benchmark, those are cumulative, which means that performance achieved year over year are added into that bucket. Uh, so you have you know, to be cognizant of that when you're setting new benchmarks. We'll have to redistribute the entire incentive amount that's associated with each performance benchmark that we're putting into the contract. So. In, in, in my opinion, the best way to do that would be before we start the option period, because right now those three benchmarks, the SE already have accomplishments which they've accrued over the past three, you know, in a quarter year, so to speak, that will be counted <coughs> towards the overall targets that we'll have to make payments against. So if we try to insert something new right now, mm -hmm. you're talking about deducting monies from set asides that they can legally make an argument that they've yeah. already, you know, earned a certain percentage of those dollars. So if we're going to make changes, we'll legally? need to do Wait, that, Sorry? But you said legally make an argument. Contractually? Yeah, well, right now, if you were to look if you were to look at their performance, especially as it relates to the gas and electric benchmark, they're almost at the end of the line where they should be at the end of year four, right now where we are. I don't understand. I, would, I mean, to disagree. I was asking when you said legally whether or not that was something that you guys had looked into. Oh, yeah, I would well, say it's because well, it's in the contract and, and we've made commitments to make payments against those performance. So. Well, also that any, any amendment has to be mutually agreed to in the current term. Yeah. So. Um, okay, so in terms of having a GHG reduction performance benchmark, I think let's carve out the discussion for the moment as to how we will handle that, will or will not handle it and when in the SU context, but 
does the board want to make a recommendation with regard to what the PSC is considering um, in terms of incorporating some sort of a GHG reduction performance standard and what the utilities are doing? So, so one question. I wanted to, um, Megan, are you still on the line? She probably dropped Maybe off. muted. No, she's muted. Are you muted? Uh -huh. I'm on. <laughs> yeah, just wanted just an injection from our side as relates to GHG uh, reduction target because um, we're discussing whether or not that should be a recommendation that goes into. Uh, the PSC, not that obviously we can't track it or that we can't convert it uh, to make that determination as relates to what the reduction is, but specifying that there is an actual target that we are achieving against. Any um, yeah, I think it, you spoke to it that there's the complexity element um, of the measurement, um, but I think in general having either a GHG reduction goal or a net MMBTU reduction goal um, allows a little bit more flexibility to more directly meet um, the overall climate goals. So I, I think we can make it work either way. Um, so, but the GHG goal in particular, I think is a little bit harder um, to get really granular when you're talking about the fuel source for an individual customer who might have, you know, a third party supplier um, that we wouldn't necessarily have visibility into. Um, but if we were to use just like a straight conversion factor, I don't think, uh, it, I don't think it's like the problem. And in fact, I think, you know, we'll have to do some things more creatively. Hey, yeah, this is, uh, this is Josh from Wash the Gas. Um, I definitely agree with that. Um, that stance as well. I think the way that we were kind of leaning towards, and uh, I don't know if it's explicitly re uh, laid out in the report that was filed with our comments, but yeah, we, we're, we're seeing on lines of you know gas savings that can be co converted over to a greenhouse gas um, metric um, with the same concerns that Megan just laid out. Yeah, and Josh and Megan, I think in the working group, we heavily decided that we probably would lean more towards tracking at this point to determine how greatest savings would be combined with DCSU savings and you guys as the utilities, is from my recollection. With that, I, I think I agree. With you. I think there was the, the working group kind of coalesced around it as um, a simplicity piece that as we're adding these other layers to them of, you know, a lot of kind of overlapping initiatives, um, or overlapping is the wrong word, but... Um, but starting simpler in the early years, get programs up and running and understanding how the programs work together before, you know, introducing additional complexity. Um, but I think, uh, you know, to Josh and I's point, I don't think that any of us are opposed to it. Um, it's just... Setting that goal, especially in year one, we haven't really done. And the analysis kind of underway, so unless we use just like a straight adder using like, you know, at a EPA's um, average metric for tons of, you know, GHG reduction per megawatt hour or per therm, um, I don't think we're in a position, I think it would delay being able to establish programs pretty substantially. To, to try to understand what that goal looks like specifically for the utilities and how it, that converts to our programs. Um, I think it would, if we want the GHG reduction to be our goal, I think that's like a, a year three thing. Like, I think we can move towards that, but I think there's additional research that has to be done before, um, before we take start making some action all around it. Thank you. Can, can I just ask, just for a little background, has PEPCO um, or one of the gas based in other jurisdictions, any of these more complicated or ways of, she's or asking, hard ways of achieving GHG reductions? Yeah, she's just asking about our other jurisdictional experiences, Megan. 
and and Washington gas. And Washington gas, gas, gas as well. Yeah. With with quantified. Uh, in all of Washington gas current. In all of our current programs, um, as well as our sister utilities, um, our primary the primary target is is an energy savings target or and or demand savings depending on the program type. Um, rather than THG, but it, we're, the utilities are in various forms participating in discussions around GHG targets, but to date, our programs are structured around energy, electric energy. And Washington Gas. I think. Uh, yeah, we're in the same boat. Yeah. Um, no, we. Uh, our, the main portfolio of energy efficiency programs that we're operating is in Maryland on the, the Empower Maryland um, initiative. And, it, yeah, we're in the same boat. Um, it, it's energy savings targets, for, so gas therms. And so that is kind of just, you know, from a programmatic perspective, you know, our, our initial thought is that we would want to get some programs up and running that kind of mirror, or at least where we have experience in, in successfully implementing programs. And uh, that the model that we would like to incorporate is, is Maryland. Um, and and so then going back to Megan's comment, where you know we can lay that foundation, get those programs up and running, and then we can kind of discover as these uh, programs are maturing over the first few years to kind of figure out what what those savings look like in terms to a GHG reduction goal. Um, this is Nina. The the District of Columbia is is moving on reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, having spent dec being one of the forerunners in the area of energy con conservation. And we're having, it's very difficult to shift out of that, that paradigm and that construct that, that frames everything we do, whether it's at the PSC or in the utilities or elsewhere. Um, and I think the sooner we we really take on the construct of greenhouse gas emissions, um, it's uncomfortable territory, but guys, we've got to do it. And I'm not saying we do it all at once or we, you know, we have an immediate goal for, for coming up with the metrics and all of that. You can't force these things beyond a certain limit, but I just... For those of us who've, who've been at the table for a while, um, it, in these it, more studies, more words, more this, more that doesn't really—it's not going to mitigate the comfort, discomfort in, in shifting to this mm -hmm. way of doing things. We need experts in our staffs of various agencies who know how to do this. We need, in other words, hiring practices need to be affected, budgets need to be affected. Um, Data, the way we keep our databases, our IT, are affected. It goes all the way down the line. Delaying it is not helpful. It's not easy for any jurisdiction to do this. And we have cut ground on in difficult areas before, that little, little old district, and there's no reason why we shouldn't do it uh, now. So I, I really, I think we need to pronounce in a progressive taking the next steps way, and um, it, it, it's an area of supreme discomfort. I agree. I'm not specialized in this. We do have somebody on our advisory board who is. Unfortunately, he's clearly not able to participate. And um, I, I was very much hoping he would provide leader, uh, thought leadership to our group on this. Um, but. Uh, anyway, I, I think we need, uh, this is a place where we can provide some thought leadership. Let's just move it, guys, so in just, some way. So just a comment uh, to supplement what Nina indicated. So I do know that definitely we have to go in that direction. So originally we were contemplating this in the context of an existing contract. So that's not appropriate and or timely. Right now we're talking about the application as it relates to new programs that are about to be stood up. And the experts who have been involved in this have just shared some of the constraints when you're moving into really developing and implementing new programs, but not to say 
that after those programs are up and running for a little bit, be it two, be it three years, that we can obviously convert to going in that particular direction. It's not a no. So how is the language advanced if we're to recommend something like this um, to be considerate of those particular variables and factors? Not to say that it's a no, but being logical, being thoughtful, as well as being appropriate around what is actually doable and what you can extrapolate from those programs being implemented to even come up with a meaningful and an appropriate target around greenhouse gas. Can I make a, a question? I guess the question is um, if there is somewhere an identification of what these programs are, where the utilities are exploring the possibility of or are doing it, or, like in California. Pardon me? Or are doing it. Or are doing it. And well, have been I, doing it. I mean, it. I guess I was thinking more of the utilities in this jurisdiction, but I mean, it's certainly helpful to know the other ones as well. Like, what, what examples are there out there? So the question is, should the board say, or like, I don't know if there is another Vences working group somewhere already, because there's like, you know, nine, a lot of them. There's two so now. You, pardon me? There's two now. On this issue? No, I mean, it's only going to be two that are coming out right now with the partial order. So it's the pilot 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 projects governance board. Yeah. And there's gonna be the rate design group. Those okay. are the only two working groups that are gonna be stood up from Power Path right now with the partial order. Oh, those and are coming out of Power Path. Okay. That have come out of Power Path with the partial order. And and conceivably pilot projects um, well, both of them will be dealing with translating into carbon impact. Right, and rate design is PIMS and Right, yeah. possibly. Um, oh, oh, okay. Three years so, is a long time. Two years is a long time. Well, so so the, my question was, if there isn't already an existing mm -hmm. home, is the board's recommendation to get an understanding of what these programs are and what a timeline is and, and ask for a require, recommend that the PSC require a report in at which we do start to operationalize or convert or see if it's possible to convert some of these learnings of the programs into actual goals and targets. Is that a board recommendation? or you, you can run a parallel. I'm not managing these things, so it's very easy for me to suggest, right? But um, you can run a parallel, um, I can't remember what it's called, kind of a parallel metrics as in, a, in a, an experimental way. In the, in, in the first instance, that way you're forced to integrate conceptually these ideas right from the get-go, but without being committed to perfect, in, you know, data and analysis. Um, so if, that's that's what I would recommend that we all do throughout our agency: is start running in parallel uh, and identify where the problems are, what needs, you know, where who's doing what, where that's that's working. What have their growing pains been? Cutting their teeth on this been, and then and cut our teeth starting now. Even if we're not held to, you know, that it's recognized an experimental, uh, parallel dimension of, of these things that we're doing. And I, I'm not just talking about utilities. I'm talking about across agencies. Can, can I just clarify a few things here? Um, I know we're talking GHG. The, the standard approach. To GHG would be the CO2 reduction metric. Equivalent? Of, yeah, of which both the SEU and the utilities can participate mm -hmm. in that. You know, the megawatt hour reductions can be converted, you know, and right. the terms reductions can be converted. But I think, you know, what we're suggesting here for this group is as soon as folks are clear to answer Biggie's questions, there are programs, all of the programs that are being run right now contribute to GHG. Outside of that, there are some additional things that can be done. The question is, do we want that to be done? For example, when we talk about strategic electrification, uh, what do we want to be incentivizing, you know, even from the transportation sector, folks to be switching from fossil fuel burning cars to electric cars. All of those things will add to awards a GHG metric, but I think from the DCSU perspective and from PEPCO's perspective, what we're primarily talking about is getting a GHG true energy efficiency. And the issue of what it can be added now or added later, we can add it pretty much at any point through this process, but it's understanding what difference would it make, for example, in the SEU's operation. 
if we were to make GHG the primary target? How would that change any of their program offerings? Will they reduce the amount of gas programs they're doing and increase the amount of electric programs they're doing? So it's just getting clearly at what it is we're trying to accomplish here and, and making it clear that it's doable. From a GHG standpoint, it is not impossible. It's very easily done. We just have to decide how we want to prioritize these metrics that we're asking the utilities and the SEU to chase. So we have a half an hour left. We very helpful. Thank you. Benchmarks um, to discuss a GHG inventory to discuss in some other housekeeping. So I'm going to make a bold suggestion that the fact that the benchmark subcommittee took up four topics does not require that the board convert those topics into recommendations for the PSC's consumption. So I'm going to suggest does it sound like we're premature on this one for the board to be able to say anything to the PSC in a month? Or do we think we can say something or want to say something? We have DC policy goals that are very strong and they're all tied to GHG. And their immediate policy goals, when you work back from 2032, and in that period of time, between now and 2032, two to three years is a very long time. It's a delay. I, I don't disagree. What I'm saying but, is So I the very board strongly recommend that we weigh in on this. And yeah. say what? And... <laughs> well, just to clarify, in, 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 in an appropriate... In, yeah, but in, that we in weigh the, in. In the working group, as Adrian discussed... We agree that it should be a tracking, tracking. metric from the utility tracking. standpoint. Tracking, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's if that the parallel. board is weighing exactly. in, is the board suggesting that it be something more than a tracking metric in the sense that it should it be the primary metric with which the utility is, is being you know measured against as opposed to the megawatt hour reductions that we kind of agreed was the primary target? Um, I, what I would encourage not having been part in, or having the bandwidth for, for the heavy duty work you're all doing on that, that that it, that be acknowledged that it's a tracking and that would be kind of that parallel that. thing mm -hmm. support that but only as a temporary building mm -hmm. block to something else yeah. and yeah. quantifying yeah. that something else um, I, I think we need to be aggressive in our conceptual formulation about it. So I was suggesting do we recommend a check in? Mm -hmm. Well the board the, so the working group is supposed to come back Megan, you know my, I'm in a lot of working groups so I mean I could be but aren't we supposed to have an annual review anyway to see wh how the programs are doing? And then after that, we're going to have a, a maybe a, a call all for everyone in the three-year mark to review the programs and lessons learned and how we can move how we can move forward. Excuse me. That's 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 if the PSC rules on having this working group continue. No, no, no. We said regardless that annually the working group needed to meet up. That well, I guess that was one of our recommendations. But after the three-year thing, the PSC had told us we need to come back afterwards, if I'm making sure Craig said it properly, that we come back in three years to review and make sure that the programs were up and standing and were where they were supposed to be. I think that well, is if I, that, I recall correctly, Adrian, um, that we were required to report on an annual basis yeah. to the PSC as the way the right rules every job can energy bill is written. Right. So, but yeah, I think, but yeah, we did. I think we did as a working group generally right. come back together on a regular basis. If the check, I mean, annual review, you know, uh, that's great. That's better than nothing. But a check-in could be identifying what needs, identifying the ne next steps. Or I'm sorry, I'm talking in very generalities. I don't know if, uh, if DOE's division on quantifying things in GHD terms <laughs> um, is, is actually, again, looking at the roadmap of clean energy DC and updating, you know, how those different uh, steps in the roadmap all tie into GHD emissions. But um, I would love to see our recommendation tied to that, where we're going, tied so to our actual if you goals. Have any questions about that? Jen Hatch is here to be able to answer them about what we track and how we track. Right. And she, so if you have any questions for Jen, she's here available. Well, maybe Jen could help us, uh, help me here because I'm kind of playing in the in the dark here, but. Um, in relationship to the clean energy DC. All of this is to meet certain goals. 
we're not talking about quantifying GHG and, and getting comfortable with the idea and blah, 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 just for the sake of switching a metric. It's to reduce greenhouse gas emissions of the city, and we all have our part to play. And in order, you can't, you can't whatever without what you can't measure. So we need to measure these things. So what do you want to know? So because I would like... A commitment in, um, I I can't remember if it's the mayor's um, compact, but we've made a commitment and we report the greenhouse gas measurements according to a standard that all the cities have to meet. That all the cities have to meet. Yes. This is becoming Would more and more like interesting and clear that it's not as mysterious as it might seem, although it's hard work. So if we can tie our recommendation to the actual timeline goals of the city's greenhouse gas emission reduction. Thank you. That would be great. So do we want to hear from... I going to bring up that page. I don't I'm not sure. How do we... Maybe Jen could. Yeah, Jen is here, and in, the, in your folders we have a presentation that we were planning uh, to have Jen provide to the board. Just a brief overview of our GHG tracking and measurement. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm Jen Hatch. I work in the Urban Sustainability Group. I do the Greenhouse Gas Accounting. I'm also helping to lead our carbon neutrality work. And so um, I think the snapshot that I provided is a slightly different question than what you're asking, so I'm going to do my best to pivot. Uh, essentially, what we're working on is, as everyone's pointed out, we're working toward now a 2050 goal of um, being net zero carbon or carbon neutral. Um, we are, the mayor has made a commitment in, in line with a number of cities um, in the U.S. and internationally to, for that zero carbon target and along with many other targets we've set in the um, interim to reporting on uh, a greenhouse gas inventory that is recognized as um, an international standard um, annually. So. Right now, we're trying to develop the strategy for how we get to 2050. So Clean Energy DC is the roadmap to 2032, and we're working on the 2050 piece. And I think a lot of your questions kind of um, fall in that intersection. Essentially, in 2050, we, we know that we have to make some really big changes between where we are now and where we need to be. And essentially, that boils down to um, massive efficiency in the energy that we're using in all sectors. Um, buildings being the most heavy energy users for us here in DC, but then also thinking about transportation, um, radically transforming our transportation network to get off passenger cars and mode shift, and then uh, electrify. And so I think that is sort of our theme um, as we are thinking about carbon neutrality, we're thinking efficiency first, and then decarbonizing what the, um, the energy that we're using beyond that. And so the one caution I would, so the inventory is something we do, and it is the tool that we have available to us that allows us to, um, it's actually a requirement of participating in a number of the um, international commitments we've made through C40, Tommy mentioned, um, the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy. Um, but it is a broad brushstroke tool to show us where we are. For example, the data that we get for the citywide inventory is aggregate data of all the electricity used in the district from PEPCO and all the gas consumed inside the district from Washington Gas. And so what it doesn't allow us to do and what, and what we don't use it for is um, really programmatic analysis. I think we have different and better tools. Um, Edward's been working on a number of things to help us get more granular and what the local impacts are. The purpose of the inventory is really to help us understand in a bigger scale how DC fits in with the larger US picture. We are using a standard that we're required to, um, which is intentionally set up to help aggregate um, 
all the smaller pieces of so states if we were a state or cities and build that up to what does the U.S. picture look like as a whole. Because of that intent of, behind that methodology, um, what it doesn't allow us to do is capture some of the granularity of local decisions that we're making in D.C. So um, we are able to do an analysis now that lets us look at we're in 2017, this, this is 2016 data, but um, 2017 is our latest inventory that we're completed. 70%, we're about 30% below our 2006 baseline overall. Okay. 70% What was the, that? Worth uh, 30% reduction in 2017 over the 2006 baseline. Okay. Um, that's, that's the right yeah, no, this is actually okay. great. It's not on here, oh, but that's okay. kind of where we are. 70% of that 30% reduction comes from the grid getting cleaner, which um, we might have had a small part to do with it, but DC's energy consumption as a portion of our bigger grid is um, pretty small. <laughs> so this is just kind of the market shifting, the plants shifting from coal to natural gas, um, which is great. That has helped us immensely. We have a long way to go. The purpose of the inventory is to make sure that we are accounting for being attached to that larger grid. And for us, um, us and other big cities who've made big clean energy commitments, not to take bites out of the renewable energy pie and then leave the dirty mix with those who aren't reporting. So we use the inventory as kind of a broad brush strokes look at where we are um, reasonably based on what we're using by being located here on our grid fed by the energy systems that we're connected to. That being said, we have big energy targets um, and I think we, when we're looking at individual policies and programs, we recognize the limits of the inventory. Um, so that methodology often isn't appropriate for us to look and help us make those decisions. What should, you know, which is better, how should we get to our greenhouse gas goal? So I think um, Edward actually has been doing a lot of work to help us capture some of those localized benefits uh, to understand how our profiles look, how our use profiles look in D.C. based on different buildings, the future of electrification. Um, so I'm, I'm afraid that right now my inventory tool is not particularly helpful to answering some of these questions. Um, but I think we, greater minds than mine, are putting lots of effort into thinking about how we can capture those benefits um, in a more useful way to help us make programmatic and policy decisions. Because um, the inventory just isn't nimble enough it's looking at an annual energy usage. It's not able to uh, be more granular than that. So I think um, that being said, we do have some long-term goals that is means that we have to back out of 2050. So if we if we know we have to be X percent more efficient by 2050, and if we want to start um, using a greater portion of renewable fuels for that, um, there are some milestones that we are starting to um, capture from our carbon neutrality work of when we will need to start transitioning systems. So, um, you know, we would hate to be putting in, um, essentially, natural gas is not compatible with a carbon neutral future. And so how do we start to think about policies and programs that can help us make the transition? Um, we can't be installing, you know, all new gas systems in 2049 if we're going to be carbon neutral in 2050. So we need to start thinking about that as we kind of plan backwards. So um, we are thinking about those, but the inventory and those policy decisions aren't necessarily the right match, um, which is why Edward has been helping us look at um, some different ways that we can think about greenhouse gas accounting that is separate from this level of accounting. So I'm not sure if that's helpful or more confusing, but I um, thought I'd at least parse the difference. And then um, I'll offer up Edward as also someone who can help answer questions. Jen, Jen can you yeah. point out to a board 
the five to a seven on the chart. Oh, yeah. So that's 2017 or 20, 2016? This is 2016. 2016? Yeah. And VMT means? Vehicle miles. Vehicle miles traveled. Oh, right. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> and the negatives mean that there's been an increase? Yes. So um, the, the long-term trends are better for the inventory analysis than year-to-year -year changes. Um, a lot of that is weather, as you'll see. Warmer summer and colder winter plays into this analysis a lot. Um, previously, we hadn't been able, we could kind of anecdotally say, wow, that was a really hot summer, or that was a really cold winter and we must have used a lot more heating fuel. Um, now we actually have a much better tool that uses NOAA weather data. Um, the SEU contribution, so this is saying that SEU's programs in reducing energy use, so um, kilowatt hours and therms, um, is responsible for 5% of the reduction between 2006 and 2016. And that is a, we thought that was really That's great. cool to, to demonstrate and to see. It's, it's again, um, broad strokes analysis. We don't know. There's no higher thinking about time of day usage or any of that, but it's broad brushstrokes, that amount of energy that we didn't use, what did that translate in over that period? Um, that is something we can continue, I plan to continue to do it um, for every year that we have the data. Um, so this has been a kind of new and exciting little tool to kind of show the power of efficiency at even just um, a small scale. We weren't sure it would show up, and there it is. Yeah. Um, I have a question for you guys. Uh, this is Megan from Pepco again. Um, in the work that you guys have been doing on estimating GHG reductions, um, in the stuff that you've been talking about, has there been any um, consideration on non-direct consumption? I mean, I think when we talk about GHG, it's not really a local thing. It's a kind of a global thing, right? Um, and since we also have a very large, we have basically no industrial base in the city, um, or, you know, has there been any talk about kind of the moral hazard that gets created because we're talking about how, how efficient the city is, but, you know, are we tracking, like, import um, into the city, like, consumption levels, because obviously inefficient manufacturing practices um, are huge contributors as well. So I'd just be curious you know, in this context and as we're talking about GHG reductions, you know, I know the goal specifically is the bill word it was around, um, you know, direct energy, but I'm, I'm just curious if the theory is thinking about it holistically at this point. Um, Megan, clarifying question, when you say consumption, do you mean of, um, like, goods, like things, all, all goods? Or are you thinking more narrowly? Just I'm thinking goods and services get yeah, goods yeah. generally. Yeah. So basically, any you know any imported manufactured product. Right. So thinking beyond just gas, like car. Thinking beyond just cars and electricity, but the broader fuel mix because we don't manufacture. So right. So, so we can do. Yeah, um, great question. The, the way our tools are set up, we are not terribly equipped to do a whole consumption-based inventory. We had one done for us at a broad level. Um, it uses national, actually this one uses international economic activity data to kind of scope down what we're consuming in DC and assign a value, a, a carbon value to it. Uh, most Western cities that are developed, um, you can estimate that they're, if you include their consumption, um, their emissions profile is about double what you see. So 50% is the direct consumed, and then another 50% is all the things that are being used in the city. It's a rough um, handle there. So our inventory doesn't directly measure consumption, um, but it doesn't, it will not prevent us from making recommendations or policies around consumption. So this comes up a lot in the, um, the buildings world where we're talking about building materials and what we're building our buildings with. So we can definitely have conversations about 
those strategies, even though we're not measuring them every year. And the reason we don't measure them every year is it's sort of an apples and oranges piece. We don't have really good data to understand, like we're relying on national economic consumption models, and then it's hard to know what to do with that. Um, so we have a, a rough picture of how big our, our footprint probably is, and then I think we look at it on the waste disposal side. Um, what are we dealing with and how can we think about closing that loop to build more of a circular economy? On the other side, is there something that we can do, an example on the building material side, to, to make recommendations on to what we should be using or shouldn't be using for those reasons? That might not be captured in a carbon accounting um, in our model every year, but we know it's out there, and so it's, um, it will probably show up in more of a narrative treatment about what we're doing, but it's not uh, a line item in our inventory. Does that help? Yeah, yeah thanks so much. Did you want to, Edward, did you want to Well, do you in? have something to help us? Because we have 10 minutes, two more topics in minutes. Is there something that you could do to help us if the board is going to formulate a recommendation with regard to how aggressive or whether or not it's saying we support verbatim what the recommendation is of the working group with the annual reporting and three-year check-in or if the board wants to say something more aggressive slash progressive? Is there a vocabulary that we can apply from what you've done? Yeah, so I mean, so Jen... As, as Jen mentioned, the, our greenhouse gas inventory is a tool for giving us a big picture. There are a couple of things that we're looking at, like my colleagues and I are looking at on the more micro scale uh, in terms of the actual greenhouse gas conversion methodologies, because the ones that are currently in place we think is outdated. So on two, two issues, two specific issues that we're going to try to sort through. Um, and again, it's not going to take years for us to figure this out, but we do need months to figure this out. Uh, so one is the um, one is the convert fuel to CO2 equivalent conversion factor, which we've been relying on EPA numbers. They themselves know that this is outdated because none of that really involves any leakage um, assumptions. So they, so if you just apply that, we're, we're not really comparing the real thing because then, you know you know you might know that. You know, because the methane is such a more potent global warming, has a more global warming potential, when you convert that, it makes a huge difference in figuring out which saves more greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, but that's not currently part of the equation. So we have to kind of figure that out. Addy uh, and I, we've been working on that, uh, our green fellow. Uh, we've been working on that, but I mean, we'll also then get uh, additional experts and consultants to help us, you know, figure this out. But I mean, some, we've begun some of the initial work. Um, another issue is like embodied carbon that Megan mentioned um, in the built structure. Uh, so I know the England has been doing some work on this. So we are going, you know, we've been talking with them a little bit on figuring out what lessons we can draw from their analysis and research. The second issue is the key, the marginal emissions rate that we talked about. Uh, because again, the, most of the methodologies that are currently in existence doesn't really distinguish the fuel source of the peak hours. So you know, but, you know, if you really want to think about greenhouse gas reduction, you want to think you want to target those peak hours that are dirtiest. Peak replenish. And you want yeah versus clean peak hours. So you want to distinguish that, but we don't. We currently don't have a methodology that's established that let us do it. So that's the marginal emissions rate research that we're doing as part of our electrification roadmap. So we should have a, at least a, a sample that we can use um, that gives us a you know, hourly emissions, hourly grid emissions rate, um, the marginal emissions rate to be specific. So we should. So we should have that this year, sometime this year, but. It, so that's the work that we're doing now. Maybe we could reference that. And that goes to OPC's point of why we should wait and let DOE do their studies. And then if there's gaps that need to be filled in with those studies, then of course we can fill that in at that time. Thanks. And um, Edward, I got the Queen Peak um, 
marginal emissions efforts, and I didn't cap yet. What was the, the first output the, of the first? Oh, it's the fuel conversion factor. Updating it or yeah, accounting updating. for leakage? Updating. Yeah, mm -hmm. updating it to include leaks. And what was the, okay, so for, it was for the leakage um, expressly. And what's your timetable for that? End of the year? Calendar. Yeah, around the end of the year. Um, or first quarter. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, so we say that they have preliminary numbers and preliminary, yeah, 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 so yeah, they, preliminary they want preliminary news. numbers and preliminary uh, okay. information. So so if the board would like, I can circulate um, a memo from our evaluators that look at the whole concept of marginal emissions rate uh, because it is part of the current DCSU measurement issue that we're dealing with. Oh, okay. So I can certainly circulate that memo to the board yeah, sure, so I you can. have something. So is the board recommendation then um, support the annual tracking and seek a citywide check-in at the conclusion of the two DOE studies? Sounds good. That's fine. Sounds, Sounds fine. really good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. I can write that one up. <laughs> and you one. might put an estimated do you need to put an estimated timeline for those DOE studies? In other words, it's not three years. Well, it... End of this year. Okay. At least for recommend, suggestion or recommendation. Yeah. Calendar. 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 Yes. Calendar. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's two more. Does the board care to say anything about um, combining energy savings, I'm sorry, yeah, combining energy savings benchmarks into a single goal, yes. Do you have two minutes for this one? Um, you guys can continue after me, but I, I definitely have a hard stop. I have a final deadline. Mm -hmm. And the second one is um, converting year one savings into lifetime savings. I guess the question is, since we have four minutes, uh, do we have a call in two weeks? Okay. <laughs> does that is that all right with yeah. people then? Yeah. Call them more sense. Okay. Would you be able to say that? Do press? Okay. Then I'm going to say we're early. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Move to adjourn. Thank you so much. Move to adjourn. Thank you. Hearing a second. Second. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Tommy, it was great to have you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.